And at a certain point, you don't need anybody else to echo it. Because you can say he's really my soul. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. If you're there and you're ready to read, would you just say amen? Amen. Let us read those three verses together. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. Amen. Amen. Maintaining a kingdom mindset. Amen. Thinking like a boss. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What I really want to get to, I probably won't get there tonight, so I'll just give a note on it at the beginning and then... Uh, next Tuesday, the Lord says the same, we'll get there and deal with it more in depth. But the reality is, is that everything in our walk with God is spiritual. We become preoccupied as fleshly creatures with fleshly stuff. And uh, those things which are fleshly or carnal are those things that often challenge our spirituality and they also manifest our spirituality. Because we are but dust, we have physical needs and desires. God is not manipulated by the physical. Jesus says, your Father in heaven already knows you have need of these things. And so he does not sweat and shiver because something is physically out of place. Uh, from generation to generation, challenges arise, whether it's Christians being persecuted in Rome, whether it's blacks being persecuted in Alabama. Uh, persecution is still persecution. Yes. But God's preoccupation is not in the physical. It's always in the spiritual. If you are the oppressor or the one position where you could be the oppressor, how do you handle power? Mm -hmm. That's a spiritual issue. If you are a victim of someone else's oppression, how do you handle victim status? How do you become a human victim and still a more than conqueror? My foreparents said, before I be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Now, their physical status was slavery. But the fight for them was not first of all getting out of physical slavery, but first of all avoiding mental slavery. Uh, if you are mentally a slave, you can be a slave with the doors wide open. Amen. Amen. And so the shackles must be removed from your mind. And so that everything that God is doing is spiritual. Whatever situation you're in, present tense, situations you were in, past tense, situations you will be in, future tense. The human condition dictates 
that you will always have some challenge. Um, whether it's youth and not having enough opportunity to exercise your own creativity, that's a challenge. Whether it's young adulthood and having the freedom to exercise opportunity but not the financial resources, still a challenge. Or whether it's later in life now, you have the wisdom, but you don't have the strength. It's challenge after challenge. And every episode of life, you cannot escape challenges. That's part of the human condition. It's something that reminds us that we're not home yet. And so God's preoccupation is always a spiritual. He is not the one who will come and find for us a utopia. If you want to live in a place, abide in a place where no one has challenges, and no one has any stresses or fears or worries, there's several cemeteries <laughs> that have a whole lot of folk with that situation. But as long as you are alive, challenges come. So then, the issue of concern is not how do we find life void of challenges, because if you're alive, you will not find it. It is how do you maintain the right perspective despite challenges. And so this Philippians 4, we saw on last week, verse 2, there's a church conflict. I beseech you and I are sent to Cain that they be of the same mind in the Lord. He doesn't tell us what the conflict is. He just says they need to be of the same mind. We saw verse 3 that not only is there church conflict, but there's also a concern for a congregant. I entreat thee also, true your fellow, help those women who labored with me in the gospel. And then verse 4, he says, and in the midst of church conflict, and in the midst of the concern for, for the congregation, make sure you don't cease adoring the Christ. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. When? Always. Always. Despite challenging circumstances, despite various nuances, despite ups and downs, good and bad, don't ever stop rejoicing, but learning how to praise him even under perplexing situations. Amen. He said, rejoice in the Lord always, and to make sure you get the message again, I say, rejoice. So then, Paul's approach is there's never a justifiable excuse for us to not be praising God. Now again, praising God can manifest itself in multiple ways. It's not always singing, it's not always clapping, it's not always shouting. It is just really adoring Him. Amen. And you can do that with a whisper. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And that's praise. So then, the mindset is the issue of concern. And he says, if you're going to have the right mindset, verse 5, you have to be spiritual enough to exercise personal discipline. Amen. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. So some things you have the right to do because you're grown. Because you're grown, you can do it. But just because you can do it, right. doesn't mean you ought to do it. All right. And so, one of the spiritual disciplines is knowing how to exercise control, moderation. And then he says, not only spiritual discipline, but verse 6, exercise personal devotion. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Now again, law would say you need to pray at a certain time. And if you miss it at that time, you have just broken the law you've sinned. But Paul is saying, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you a schedule. I'm just telling you in everything. In everything by prayer and supplication. So when do I pray? I pray when things are good. Pray when things are bad. I pray when I'm happy. I pray when I'm sad. I pray when my friends are in my corner. I pray when my friends have forsaken me. In everything. I'm talking to God. Now prayer there is communion with him. Practicing his presence. Knowing that he is with me. Knowing that I am in his will because I'm with him. Not spending my life on pause waiting for God to show me his will. He doesn't have to show me his will if I live in it. Right. Right. And so I'm practicing his presence. That's what pray to God means. And then he says, but, but just not just practicing his presence, but with supplication, which means I pray to God, but I also petition God. And during our study of prayer, one of our catchphrases was a prayer to God is a prayer for God. So my petitioning him, my supplication, the context is not I'm begging him for something material, fleshly, or carnal, or something tangible. Because I just said everything with him is spiritual. So here's, here's comes the concern. Lord, I know I'm supposed to be praising you. And I'm committed to praising you. But right now, it's kind of difficult. And I need you to help me see what I need to see like I need to see it so that I don't lose focus in the midst of this situation. And here's what you would discover is, is that you can be as easily distracted by good as you can by bad. And so, good times, that's real spiritual maturity. When things are going good, and then you think about it, and you say, Lord, I don't want this surplus to throw my focus off. So, before I spend too much time celebrating the surplus, I need to pull back and ask you to make sure, help me make sure, that I'm still focusing on you. And then because we do know that whenever we pray to God for God, the Bible is emphatically clear, repeatedly, that when we ask, we shall receive. Yeah. Uh, he says, if you've been good, know how to give. You've been evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Uh, the Bible says that he that comes to God must first believe that he is. And that he is a reward to them that diligently seek him. So there is absolutely no scripture that ever suggests that if I seek God, he's going to turn me down. Right. So if you really want to pray a prayer where you can be guaranteed an answer, ask God for God. Lord, let me see you more clearly. Let me become more like you. Let me, let, let me discover the joy that I'm supposed to have because of my connection to you. He always gives a yes to that. And so since I know I'm going to get a yes, I can ask him with thanksgiving. Which means it's a prayer to God, a petition, petitioning of God, but it's also praising God while I petition. And then the provision from God is verse 7. Peace. And 
Again, the spiritual resource is what God is after. That in the midst of all of the conflicting conditions, in the midst of all the unforeseeable circumstances, in the midst of all the difficult dilemmas, if I still have peace, I'm all right. And I know it's peace that comes from God because me having peace don't even make sense to me. Because right. right. it says it's the peace of God that passes all understanding. Not just your understanding. It don't, I don't even understand it. I remember a man whose wife had suddenly passed she had a disease, but she had fallen in the backyard and the next day died. And the husband said to me later, he said, I was sitting in the funeral feeling guilty because I had so much peace. And the spirit reminded me, I asked him for peace. I said to him, I... Lord, I don't know when you're going to take her. You may take me before her, but I don't know how I can handle if you take her. But, but, but if you take her before me, please give me peace. He said, I was sitting in the funeral encouraging other people and feeling guilty about it. And the Spirit said, didn't you ask me for peace? And so predicaments don't destroy you if peace directs you. So the issue is not, Lord, make things easier, but make me stronger. Yeah. Don't take away all of the problems. I'm not, I'm not looking for them. I'm not asking for them, but I know they're coming. So don't take away all the problems, but let me maintain peace in the midst of the problems so that I'm not defined by the stuff outside of me. He said, the peace of God, the passive, all understanding will literally be a security guard to your heart and mind. Now, the way that works, it's a picture of peace pacing the floor. Your heart and mind is back here. And it's pacing the floor. And anything that comes towards your heart and mind that looks like confusion, peace says, hold up. And so then what starts happening is you can find out early in a conversation or early in a television show or early in something you're reading, ah, oh, that ain't welcome. Yeah. Preacher called me on the way to church and he said, man, I got something to tell you. You got a couple of minutes? I said, no, I'm almost at church. I got Bible study. He said, oh, I'll call you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> You might not want to hear this before Bible study. And that's how peace does. Peace says, oh no, no, not now. You're not welcome here. I'm guarding the premises. And if you are not accelerating peace, you are not welcome. And so a lot of times, we start wondering why some things that used to come around stop coming around. Peace might be sending it away. And the worst thing you can do is to say to peace, I want it back. Right. <laughs> and so peace then becomes the provision that God gives to those who practice spiritual discipline. Now, whatever one thing is true, then the reverse of it reverses the outcome. Which means then, if we have the wrong information, he says, think on these things in verse 8, if we have the wrong information, the wrong information can multiply the conflict and magnify your concerns. And whatever the conflict is multiplied and the concern is magnified, then it's going to 
bring a halt to our hallelujahs. Some people are saying, I, I, I'm trying my best to keep praising God. I just can't do it. I'm trying, but, but you just don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. And whenever that becomes your testimony, you are focusing on the carnal. Paul and the scriptures are saying, that's not what's hindering your hallelujahs. It's your perspective. And so if you get the wrong information, it can multiply the conflict and magnify the concern, which is why Brother Williams was right earlier. People don't know often what they're missing when they don't come where the word is being taught. Because when you miss the word, you might be going somewhere listening to something that's wrong information, multi multiplying your conflict and magnifying your concern, and now all of a sudden when you finally do make it to church, you can't praise God because you're so frustrated. <laughs> there are universal laws, and I kind of echoed this the last few years, Repeatedly, there are universal laws initiated by God and prayer doesn't change it. I, 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 I cannot pray long enough to make the sun cold. <laughs> I don't care how much I don't like summer, which I personally I, I, I don't dislike summer, but if it did, if I hate it summer, I can pray and fast all spring, fall, and winter. I claim it in the name of Jesus. No heat this summer. Lord, you're going to keep it cool in Birmingham this summer. I claim it in his name. Hallelujah. I'm going to name claim, blab, grab, and sweat this up. <laughs> Because prayer does not alter God's universal law. So then, prayer does more to change the prayer than it does to change God. What prayer does is, is it puts me in tune with God's agenda so that whatever my agenda is, it becomes subservient to His. If I pray and pray right, prayer might reveal to me it's going to be hot this summer. So you might as well start getting the air conditioner fixed. <laughs> and so prayer does not alter universal law. It does not alter God. God is too wise for me to give him an idea better than the one he has in mind. I can have good intentions. I can be passionate in my effort. I can be hard working. But the wrong information won't get me to the right place. If someone gives me a map of Chicago when I'm in Birmingham and I think it's a map of Birmingham, I can be passionate, focused, disciplined, faithful in following the map, right. I will not get around Birmingham correctly. Because the wrong information will never produce the right results. Right. And so it's important, it's imperative in fact, that we get the right information if we're going to maintain a kingdom mindset. The right information, verse 9, says it transforms the soul, the mind. Verse 9 says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And then the God of peace shall be with you. But you got to do it. Knowledge is something most people have. But there's a shortage of wisdom. Amen. Everyone who has a driver's license knows how to drive a car. <laughs> and take a test. 
test. Got to take a driver's test. They wouldn't have gotten a license if they didn't know how to drive a car. But all of them don't have enough sense, <laughs> wisdom, to be behind a steering wheel. And so there's not a shortage of knowledge. We swim in a sea of facts, James Costin says. And so we've got knowledge and access to knowledge. But how do you apply that knowledge? Then that's a spiritual issue. And I need God, and we need God to reveal to us how to apply knowledge. Love your enemies. We know that. But there are a couple problems with that if, we don't, if we're not spiritual. Number one, we don't even have discernment to know who the enemy is. Right. The peril that many people fall under is that they befriend their enemies and shun their friends. Right. So first of all, we gotta we have discernment enough to know who the enemy is. Then secondly, love them. That takes the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that means I'm seeking their good even though they're not seeking mine. Mm -hmm. Now we know that, but obviously everybody doesn't have the wisdom to apply it. And so then, prayer is our taking that knowledge, knowing the truth, and allowing our spirit to be governed by the Holy Spirit according to the truth we've heard. So literally what we do every time we hear truth, or read truth, and we, the spirit affirms to us that's truth, we reserve some time in prayer to allow the Holy Spirit to really sear that in our spirits so that it starts making sense to us. Right. See, love your enemies in Bible study is really not a big task. Amen. It's when you see the enemy up to no good that it becomes more difficult. And so oftentimes it takes those tests and those challenges for us to really be able to accurately gauge our spiritual growth. Amen. Not in Sunday school, because we can all give the right answers in Sunday school. Amen. It's when God says, close up your books, it's test time. Amen. And we began to see, well, maybe I hadn't mastered it as well as I thought. Right. And so, Verse 8 tells us we've got to know the truth, but we've got to meditate on that truth. Meditate on it. Not just memorize it, but meditate on it. And the interesting thing about the context of verse 8 is that the emphasis is really on the person of God. He says, well, so other things are true. Now, that's literally a reference to discernment of people. Specifically, of God. So I can always understand the why of God's activities. But even when I can't track him, I ought to be able to trust him. Yeah. I don't know why he's allowing this to happen. Yeah. I don't know why he didn't put this to, to a halt. Why he didn't stop this. I don't understand it. But he's always taking care of me. Yeah. So I'm going to trust him until his will is made clear. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I think on those things which are true, I am really meditating on the integrity of God. Right. That he's always been trustworthy. Hadn't always done what I thought he should do. I hadn't always liked what he did. Mm -hmm. But every time I stayed with him, yes. it made sense later on. Right. Yeah. All right. So even while it's not making sense, I'm not going to focus on the fact that it's not making sense to me now. 
I'm going to focus on the fact that he's been consistent, not only in my life, but generation after generation, he has been true. Thinking on those things not only that are true, but those things which are honest. That means venerable, worthy of respect. That I'm meditating on the fact that not only has God been one who has consistently demonstrated integrity, but he also proves himself to be worthy of my respect. Amen. So yeah, Lord, I have some questions, but I'm not trying to overthrow you. I understand, but I'm not trying to impeach you. Because if I decide that God is not a good enough God, I'll have a backup choice. So I'm meditating on the fact that he's worthy of my respect. He demands and deserves my respect. He's also just. Think on those things. He is the one that sets the rules and regulations whereby man may live. Isn't it amazing how God created this universe and it's still operating? Yeah. Sun still shining. Stars are still in their silver sockets. Wind still blows. Some kind of way grass still turns green. Water still wet, oceans, rivers, lakes, swamps, ponds, birds are still flying. And none of them ever went to aviation school. Fish still swimming, never went to the Y to learn how to swim. Isn't it amazing? God started this and is still keeping it together. And so since he is just, He's the one that established the rules and the regulations whereby we must live. Mm -hmm. When I meditate, I'm going to think on the fact that even though God's doings are not always clear to me, he's been doing what he's been doing long before I came on the scene. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you watch the animal channel and see wildlife and how animals hunt each other. It seems brutal, but it has a way of keeping the population right. One animal survives by eating another, another animal survives by eating that one. And life continues going on. And so he is true, honest, just, pure free from defilements and impurities. Th that means that God's judgments are not tainted. That, that, I, I mean, I understand why God didn't give me the talent he gave you. Why he made me this height and not another height. Oh, life would be so much different if I had Shaquille O'Neal's height. <laughs> Oh, life would be so different. <laughs> Why God didn't give me that? I, I, I could swear up and down, Lord, if you had given me that height and that exposure, I promise I would use all of that for your glory. <laughs> He chose to do what he did and what he does like he chooses. But for him, it's not about those, those earth, earthly manifestations. What am I doing with what he gave me? What am I doing with who I am? What am I doing with the opportunities that I have? What am I doing with the open door he's provided for me? And if I'm slothful with what he gives me, I would have been slothful if he had given me something else. Amen. Amen. And so I meditate on the fact that he's not favoring one over the other. Amen. He 
He may give you a certain talent and somebody else another talent, but he's not determining whether or not you get to heaven based on your talent. Right. He's observing what you do with what he gave you. Right. And so one man born with no legs, no feet, no legs, no, no arms, two hands, two feet, and because of his infirmity, yes. he has traveled the world as a motivational speaker. Yes. None of us would ask God that we be born like that. Yes. But God's strength yes. was made perfect in his weakness. Yes. And the same God whose strength can be made perfect in his weakness is the same God whose strength can be made perfect in all of our weakness. Amen. So it's not how he made us and what opportunities we have. It is how can I have the mindset to meditate on who he is so that who he is can be manifested through who I am. Amen. So that I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Every head is bowed and eyes closed. God, help us to remember that from your vantage point, you're looking at the spiritual. Where are we in mind? Where are we in our devotion? In our discipline? So regardless to what blood, family, blood runs through our veins, we qualify to be instruments of yours because you are pure in your judgments. And so Lord, if there's any person here who does not know you in the pardon of their sins, I pray to God that they would come to you tonight for there is no guarantee they'll get another chance. For every one of us that's saved, we, I pray to God that we would not just be hearers of this word, but we would meditate on this word, that we might be transformed by this word. And so this word can be manifested in our lives. We love you and we thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we stand together, the privilege of the church is extended. The doors of the church are open. Come to Jesus just now. He will save you just now. If there's one, won't you come? Candidate for baptism, letter of Christian experience.